Okay, we're coming now to one of the most famous passages in Romans. And like most famous passages, not everyone agrees about what it means. Perhaps that's what makes it so famous, is that the controversies over it give it a lot of publicity. But also I think it's, it would be famous because when you read it, you say, yeah. Now you're talking words I can understand, Paul. I mean, you've been talking about living free from sin and fruit for holiness and uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, I can track with you a little bit that how you, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be. But here, now, you're talking my language. You know what to do, but you don't do it. That's me all over, you know. I mean, that's what people, when they read that, they say, now the Bible is relevant. And yet, in what way is it relevant? What is it really trying to get across? And this is what there are several different theories about and some diametrically opposed to each other about what Paul's doing here. So let's read the whole section, and then I will talk about what some of the theories are, and then uh, look at the passage itself to see which theories or theory has uh, maybe the most support in the passage. Beginning with Romans 7.13, Has then that which is good become death to me? Now remember, what, what is it that, that was good? He just said in the previous verse, the law and the commandment are holy and just and good. And yet he had said, sin used it and killed him. So that seems to raise the question, then is that which is good a cause of death to me? He said, certainly not. But sin, that it might appear son, sin, was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. On, on one hand, the commandment did serve a good purpose. It, it exposed how bad sin is. But, of course, it didn't do me any good because, as he says in verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate... That I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For, I, to, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now, what is this talking about? I think without any kind of instruction to the contrary if people read this passage they're assuming that Paul's talking about his own present experience this suggestion is met with certain objections from people in different theological camps for certain reasons one of the problems is that Paul says in verse 14 I am carnal now carnal is Paul a carnal Christian or is he a spiritual Christian why would he say, I am carnal? This raises questions. Is he maybe speaking in the person or in the role of somebody who's not really like he is, but who is actually carnal? Is he describing a carnal person's struggle, not his own? This is what some people think. Because it does say in chapter 8 and verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God or hostility toward God. 
for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And this kind of sounds like what he's describing here. The carnally minded person can't seem to obey God. And he says, I am carnal. So is it possible he's describing someone else, not himself, or maybe himself at an earlier time in his life? These are some of the theories that have been suggested. And it's because he said, I am carnal. Another thing is, he said in verse 14, I'm sold under sin. Can a Christian be said to be sold under sin? Haven't we been purchased with a price? Don't we belong to Christ? Uh, is this possibly a statement more suited to describing an unbeliever? Certainly, it seems strange to hear Paul say, I'm carnal, sold under sin. And so many people think he's not talking about his actual experience as a mature Christian man. He's talking either about his pre-Christian life or his early, more carnal Christian stage, but he's not talking about his, himself now as a spiritual man. That's what they say. And there's another reason for thinking that taking him as speaking about the, the present uh, struggle in his mature Christian life and not taking that literally, is that in chapter 6, in verse 12, he said, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, yet you should obey it in its lusts. And verse 14, chapter 6, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law but under grace. Now they say this is, sounds like Paul's describing himself as having sin has dominion over him. After all, it does say in Romans 7.25, so then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. It sounds like he's a slave of sin. Sin has dominion over him and so forth. So some of the things Paul said earlier and just things we know about Paul, and, if, and even a few things he'll say later in chapter 8, have led many people to believe this passage cannot be taken at face value. At face value, Paul seems to be talking in the present tense about himself. But can we really believe that Paul would say such things about himself in his mature Christian life? And so many people have thought, no, he's talking about something else. And some of the theories that have been offered are, A, Paul is describing his frustration of his pre-Christian life as a Pharisee prior to his conversion, because as a Pharisee, he delighted in the law of God in a certain way. He was taught the law of God. He was, he was a, a zealous for the law of God. And yet, <clears throat> because he didn't have Christ, he was not able, to, uh, not able to live up to it until he found Christ. So some people believe Paul is referring to himself in his pre-conversion days, specifically as a Pharisee who loved the law but couldn't keep it. Another theory that's often suggested is that he's talking about the uh, the state of a, a person who is a Christian, but is not a spiritual Christian. They're a carnal Christian. And they need some additional uh, advantage that he wants to recommend in chapter 8. And depending on who has this theory, some think what he, this is a person who has not yet had entire sanctification. A, a Christian who knows they should live holy, but can't. And they need to have the, the uh, entire sanctification experience, the second work of grace. Or uh, a Pentecostal might see it a little differently and say this is a person who's not baptized in the Spirit. They don't have the power of the Spirit. Jesus said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and they seem weak. They have uh, the interest in doing what's right. He says, I know that to want to do uh, good is present with me, but I can't find the power. So some would say, well, this is a reference to a Christian who has not yet had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or, for people who are in neither of those camps, they might just say it's a carnal Christian who needs to get his act together and grow up in the Lord and become a spiritual Christian. In any case, it isn't Paul in his present state because he, as he wrote this book, is a spiritual Christian and would not describe himself in this way, they tell us. Okay? So that's a, another aspect of, of what people do is to find alternatives. First of all, it was Paul as a Pharisee. Secondly, it's a Christian who's carnal, who needs something more, either just to grow up or to get the entire sanctification or to get the baptism of the Spirit or something else. This is different people, different camps have their different ways of uh, you know, identifying exactly what's lacking 
in the person's life here, but he's not describing the normal Christian life, but maybe the average one. The norm is better than that. The bar is higher than that. There, the possibilities are better than this. But the average Christian is not really attaining them. This is a Christian not living up to his privileges, perhaps. So say some. And then there's another theory, and that is that he's actually personifying the human race in himself, or maybe even the Jewish race. And basically he's saying human beings, or Jews in general, they are like this. I, I'll be one. I'll put on my Jew hat or my human race hat, and the human race is basically without the ability to do what's right, even if they have some intuitive knowledge of what's right and wrong. They don't really have the power to do it. They need to get saved. So there's a sense in which it could be an unsaved person or a carnal person, anything, something, not uh, an abnormal person, not a, at least not a normal spiritual person. These are all the theories. Now, despite all these theories and the objections that they have to the first suggestion, the first suggestion being that Paul is talking about something that he could relate to even at that point in his life, there are several things to consider which might point to following our first impressions. That Paul really is talking about a normal Christian, including himself. Now, why would we think such a thing? There's several things to consider here, exegetically. One is that in verses 5 through 13, he was speaking autobiographically in the past tense. He says, especially in verse uh, verse. Uh, Seven, I would uh, not have known sin except through the law. That's past tense. Uh, he says in verse 8, sin uh, produced in me, past tense, all manner of evil. Sin was dead. I was alive once, but I died, and then I found uh, I was killed. That's past tense. There's, a, there's some certain autobiographical material here about Paul in the past tense, but suddenly there's a change to the present tense. Verse 14, I am carnal. I have this problem. I don't understand what I am doing. Changes dramatically from the past tense to the present tense. Now, this is the first and most obvious thing that a person will notice. And it does certainly give the impression if he was talking about himself in the past tense in the earlier verses, now that he's talking about himself in the present tense, he's still talking about himself. But now, instead of what it was then. And that's something that has to be dealt with. If we're going to say Paul's not talking about his present experience, and then we have to explain why did he shift from the past pre to the present tense. Maybe there are answers adequate for this, but we have to definitely answer them or else we can't, can't ignore that he may be talking about himself in his spiritual life. A second consideration is that to say that Paul is talking about himself currently is realistic. Have you ever met a Christian however spiritual, who didn't relate with this? I mean, we might think Paul is the super Christian. He's the one man who couldn't relate with this. But all the people I know at any range of spirituality, when they read this, they say, yeah, I, I, I don't live up to my desires either. You see, it, it isn't saying that he's an absolute depraved uh, serial killer. He's just saying, I know... I have this standard of what I want to do, and I fall short of the standard. Now, his standard may be extremely high, and his falling short may still be a very high level of behavior, but just short of the perfect standard. He doesn't say, I'm just wallowing in sin all the time. He doesn't even say how often he sins. You know, the more spiritual a man is, the more his desire for perfection is honed. Because the more you focus on God, well, the more spiritual you are and the more you appreciate holiness and goodness and righteousness and want to please God and so forth. And therefore, a person who barely knows God and isn't very spiritual, the standard he sets for himself may be above what he's attaining, but it's not all that high. But the more spiritual you are, the more you recognize what your spiritual duties are, the more you realize what, where the bar is. And you may be exceedingly spiritual and very well behaved and very righteous as men go, but not as righteous as God, not as... You're not performing as well as you would like to and want to. So, I mean, there's a sense which Paul may not be arguing that he's a sinful man, but rather that even if he's a spiritual man, 
he knows more than he lives up to. He doesn't measure up to the high standard that he would like to. That's not unrealistic. Any spiritual man would say that about himself and would not be doing it to be humble. They'd say it because they know that very struggle. They know that they don't live up to perfection. And so there's a very good reason to say, why can't he be talking about himself? Anyone else could write this and be talking about themselves. Why not him? Another consideration is that to take this as a, as a description of a normal Christian life, including his own, would agree admirably with what he said in Galatians 5.17. Remember, Galatians and Romans follow very closely each other theologically. And in Galatians 5.17, he says, The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. Well, that sounds like, a, you know, Romans 7 in a, in a nutshell. I've got my spirit wanting one thing. I've got my flesh wanting something else. There's a contrariness in there. There's, a, there's mixed desires, and I don't end up doing what I want to do. And yet Paul is not, I mean, Paul's saying this is so with his readers. They're Christians, and this is the way it is with Christians. Also, of course, we know that in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul was very mindful of his sinfulness. In 1 Timothy 1 15, he says, this is a, a true saying worthy of all acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Paul didn't have a sense of being a perfect man. He had a sense of being the chief of sinners. Now, of course, we might say he was thinking primarily of his pre-Christian sinning, and he could have said that. I was the chief. And Jesus came to save sinners, and I was the chief of those people. But he says, I am the chief. And it may simply be that he knew that sin, which dominated him before he was a Christian, is still resident in his flesh and needs to be mastered, needs to be uh, restrained. But he knew himself to be a sinner. Now, this person according to verse 22, delights in the law of God. And yet the unregenerate person does not. According to chapter 8, verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the car to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The carnal mind is enmity against God. But the description in chapter 7, verse 22 is of one who delights in the law of God and is in her heart. Furthermore, in verse 25, at the end of this chapter, he surprises us because he has just asked a, a, a searching question in verse 24. Who will deliver me from this horrible situation I'm in? That I've just heard this utter frustration and bondage to sin. Who's going who's gonna to fix this? And you think you've got the answer in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you expect, oh good, we reached the solution to that. But then he says, so then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Whoa, how is that any better than what was before? Why does he rejoice in Christ Jesus as the deliverer when, in fact, after he's done that, he... Uh, he says the situation still remains. Even after Christ is my solution, I still find this tendency in my mind to serve the law of God, as he did in verse 22, but in his flesh the law of sin, as he did in verse 23. Besides this, in Romans 8, 23, Romans 8, 23, Paul says, not only they, meaning the creation, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. Now, we're groaning within ourselves. Why? Are we in pain, physical pain? Well, some people are, but not all of us. Paul probably wasn't even at that moment necessarily in physical. What's he groaning about? He's groaning about this wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Looking forward to the redemption of the body, I, we groan in ourselves. And not just the carnal among us, those who have the spirit. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan. 
It sounds like chapter 7 is a, a specimen of that groaning and therefore not inconsistent with Paul as he would understand the Christian life in general. Then there's this other thing too. In verse 17 and 20, he again somewhat shocks us by saying in verse 17, now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Sounds like he's kind of sloughing off responsibility here. I'm sinning, but it's not me. It's just sin in me. Almost sounds like he's saying, I'm not guilty. It's not my problem. It's just, I'm, you know, just sin. Blame sin. Don't blame me. Now, that's not exactly what he's doing. Though there is an element of that that we need to consider because he, I mean, he does say what he means. But what does he mean? He seems to mean that I have two wills. One is mine. And the other is one I didn't choose. The one I choose is the one that's in my mind, the law of my mind. I delight in the law of God with my inner man. I choose that. The law that's in my members, that came with the equipment. I didn't ask for that. But it, it's another law. It's another mind. I've, I have two sets of desires. And the reason that uh, I'm having this groaning is because I actually am on God's side. And my body hasn't changed. It's still got that same sin in it that it had before I was a Christian and will have until it's redeemed. The redemption of the body we groan for in chapter 8, verse 23. Now let me show you something about this here. If you look over at Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2, Paul is describing the state of the lost, even the state of us when we were lost. And in Ephesians 2, 3, he says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now, we once had that, that uh, natural alienation from God, too, because we were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Actually, the word desires there in the Greek is the word wills. There are two wills in man, the will of his flesh and the will of his mind. Now, when we were lost, we fulfilled them both simultaneously. Why? Because my mind was on the same side as my flesh. In living in sin, fulfilling the flesh, I was fulfilling the will of my flesh too, but that was also the will of my mind. There was no conflict. I didn't aspire to overcome the will of my flesh. My mind was right on track with my flesh. I was carnally minded. I was minding the things of the flesh. And therefore, when I was a sinner, I was obeying the will of my flesh and of the mind because they were not at odds with each other. But what happens when you repent? What does the word repent mean? Repent means to change your mind. When you become a Christian, you change your mind, but you don't change your flesh. Before you're a Christian, you have a, you, the will of your flesh and the will of your mind are the same as each other. When you become a Christian, you repent and you change your mind and you don't agree with the will of the flesh anymore. Now there's a conflict that wasn't there before because your flesh is going to still want the same things it wanted before, but your mind is now saying, no, I want to obey God. And so this is why Christians have a conflict that many times non-Christians don't have because we sin and they sin, but we don't want to. They do want to. Their mind and their flesh want the same things. They have the same will. But Paul's describing a situation where someone has repented and his mind wants to obey the law of God. He delights in the law of God. He's, he's not agreeable with sin anymore. And it, he hates it when he sins. And he actually says, if I'm doing what I hate, it's not me. My flesh still has this sin that wants what it wants. But I have taken sides with God. I have changed my mind, my convictions, my direction. I am choosing to go with God. And therefore, I am not the one who's sinning. There's something about me that is sinning. And I have to get control of it. But God knows who I am. I'm who I am in my mind. I hate sin. I love the law of God. I want to live a holy life. 
That's who I am. So why do I do these things? It's not really who I am. It's something that's in my members. I have changed the law of my mind. I was not given the opportunity to change the law of my flesh. But I look forward to it. I groan looking forward to the redemption of my body because then I'll have that changed too. In the meantime, I live in the tension between one of my wills has changed and the other will hasn't. Before I was a Christian, I had two wills, but they, they were on the same track, going the same direction. Now I've turned one of them around. But the old ones still go in the same direction. We're like on a collision course, pulling two different directions. My mind has chosen to follow God. And that's what defines who I am. I am who I choose. I am defined and identified with my choice to follow God. When God sees me, he knows I'm his. And at the end of the chapter, when he says, so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And the next verse says, therefore, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why? Therefore means because of what? Because God knows my mind is at his service. My personality, who I am, all that I have to say about myself has been turned his direction, and he knows. And he therefore doesn't condemn me. But the fact that he doesn't condemn me doesn't mean I'm going to just go ahead and live in sin because the reason he doesn't condemn me is because I hate the sin. So why would I go ahead and live in it? Living on in sin is not what I want. If it was what I wanted, then I wouldn't be on God's side. The, the very fact that I am on God's side makes me hate it. And he says, even the fact that I hate it tells me I'm on God's side. He says in verse uh, 20, now, if I do what I will not to do. Okay, well, who is that willing not to do? It's me willing not to do it. If I end up doing what I am willing not to do, that means I'm not willing to do that. My convictions are against it. Something in me makes me do it. I, see, I find a law in my members bringing me into bondage. My body does things it's not supposed to do, but I don't agree with that. I hate it. And the fact that I hate it really tells who I am. Am I a person in rebellion against God or am I a person who's a lover of God, a follower of God, who has a bondage that he needs to somehow overcome? Now, I do need to overcome it. And if my heart is really God's, I'm going to be determined to do so anyway because I hate the sin. You're not going to be you know, living with a headache if you have the power to get rid of it. If you can take an aspirin and make it go away, you're not going to live the rest of your life with a headache. You're going to just get rid of it. Likewise with sin. If you hate sin, you're not going to just say, oh, well, it's, it's not me anyway. It's just sin to me, so it's cool. It's not cool. I hate it. And if I hate it, I'm determined to get rid of it. But how? The main thing he tells us here is, if, although I have not overcome sin 100% in my life, I'm not condemned because God knows with my law, I'm, with my mind, I'm serving his law. He knows I delight in his law. He knows what my choice is. He knows who I am by my choice and my will of my mind. He also knows that my flesh has a will of its own, a law in it that brings me into bondage. And he will deliver me from that too. That has not fully happened yet. And the solution is going to be threefold, as we shall see in chapter 8. There are three it's a threefold victory, but notice this. In those two verses I quote, I read, verse, uh, verses 17 and 20. Notice both of them have the phrase, no longer. Now, it is no longer I who do it. And in, in verse 20, uh, it is no longer I who do it. No longer. What does that mean? It means once it was. There was a time that it was me doing this, but it's no longer that way. Something has changed. There's, I'm not in my original sinful condition because then I was the one doing it. It's no longer. I, I'm converted now. Uh, something has changed. I'm not in my original condition. There's a change here. What has changed is not that I now live a perfect life, but what has changed is now I, I'm determined to do so. God knows that determination, and he reckons that as faithfulness to me, and therefore as righteousness, therefore there's no condemnation. He knows I'm faithful to him. Remember when Jesus said, 
when he, when he told his disciples, watch, stay awake for one hour and pray with me. And they didn't. That was a direct command they broke. He gave them a direct command, watch, stay awake and pray with me. And they didn't do it. They fell asleep. So what did he say about that? He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, you want to do what's right. I know that. I know your spirit is willing. And I know you're just falling asleep, therefore breaking my command. Not because you're in rebellion, but because you can't help it. You are weak. Your flesh is weak. This, I think, is evidence that God sees what you have chosen. And uh, to a very large degree, that choice counts more than anything else in determining whether he sees you as his or not. Have you chosen him? Is your mind on his side? Well, of course, you're going to want to get your, your flesh under control too. You're going to want to behave righteously. Christians want to and do. But how to do that has not yet been brought out. One thing is clear, the law is not going to do it because he had the law and he, didn't, he couldn't live up to it. So there's got to be some other solution than the law, and we will find it. He is going to give it. But in the meantime, while we still don't have this victory complete, we're under no condemnation because God realizes that this is a struggle we're having. You know, when someone says, boy, I'm really struggling with temptation to get drunk. Uh, I'm really struggling with homosexual desire or whatever like that. I think, good. I'm glad you're struggling. You should be struggling against it. If you're struggling, you're on God's side. It's when you stop struggling. It's when you decide, ah, it's okay, I'm, I'm just going to go with this. I'm just going to take the path of least resistance. I'm going to just get drunk. I'm just going to succumb to temptation. I'm just going to follow my flesh. Then you're in trouble because you're not struggling. Christianity is a struggle. You have desires of the flesh. Sometimes they even beat you once in a while. Now, I don't think that Paul sinned very often. I don't think that spiritual Christians do. I think spiritual Christians can, can live a very righteous life, especially with the resources of the Spirit that Paul's going to bring up in the next chapter. This is not suggesting that we're just doomed to be you know, hopeless sinners. It's that God knows that as Christians, when we do sin, it's not really what we want to do. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And James said that in James 3, 2. He said, we, in many things, we all stumble. Now, what is stumbling? Stumbling is falling down. Stumbling is accidental. Stumbling is embarrassing to the person who stumbles. They don't want to do it. Nobody decides to get up in the morning and think, I think I'll just stumble a few times before I get to my car. No one wants to stumble. Stumbling happens because of weakness or carelessness or something like that. And those things exist in us. We are careless. We are weak sometimes. And James said in many things, we all stumble. And he included himself in the we all. James the apostle, the main leader of the church in Jerusalem at that time, he says, we all stumble. But you see, no one makes a case for normalizing stumbling. You, you know, if you are walking down the street and you're talking to someone you're not paying attention and trip over a crack in the sidewalk and you go down, you don't get up and say, well, that's okay. That's okay. In fact, I'm going to try to do that regularly. No, no, no one makes a case to normalize stumbling. Stumbling is a defect, and no one likes stumbling. It hurts. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. Stumbling happens, but you don't want it to. And James said, in many things, we all do it. Now, this is not some kind of an excuse for sinning, but you see, the person whose heart is for God doesn't want an excuse for sinning. That's the thing. A lot of people read what Paul says. Oh, well, then I guess I can just go out and sin because it's not me. It's sin that dwells in me. I really am a Christian, but I, I'll just go out and sin. Wait a Christians don't say that. <laughs> Christians don't say, well, I'll just go out and sin then. If you're saying that, then you aren't the one that he's talking about. You're not delighting in the law of God. If you're saying, oh, boy, maybe I can get away with sinning now because it's not me, it's sin. As soon as someone uses this, for an excuse to sin, they demonstrate they're not him. They're not the one he's talking about. The person he's talking about doesn't want to sin. He hates the sin. He sins out of weakness and out of inattention and so forth. And he's looking for a way to stop. 
in Romans 7, he doesn't really lay out the way to stop, but he does in chapter 8. We're not done yet, but we're very realistic. There's no reason for Paul not to be talking about himself. I suspect Paul stumbled much less than I do, perhaps much less than any spiritual man living today does. But there's no reason to believe he never stumbled. James said he stumbled, and James was a holy man and an apostle. Why? I, I doubt that Paul would say that he never stumbled. And if he did stumble, then he could write Romans 7. I didn't want to stumble. I don't like stumbling. I want to do it right all the time. I stumble once in a while. That doesn't make me an evil man. It means I'm a weak man and I need to do better. But in the meantime, there's no condemnation because God knows that I'm on his side. I'm not on the enemy's side. The enemy still has a bit of a lasso around my legs and I've tripped sometimes and fall down, but but God knows I, I'd cut that thing off if I could in an instant. I don't want that. I mean, you can tell, the way you re respond to this in your heart would tell you whether you're the person he's describing or, or not himself. I think, would, I think it would fit him too. Now, some might say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't answer the question. Why does he say, I am carnal? Well, that's it. The word carnal means fleshly or, or enfleshed, encased in flesh. It's not a spiritual assessment. Now, it's true in chapter 8, he talks about being carnally minded or fleshly minded. That's not what he says he is. He's actually spiritually minded. In his inner man, he loves the law of God. The carnal man does not. The carnally minded man does not. But even the spiritual man is encased in flesh. Carnal means I'm made of flesh. And that's really what gives me most of my problems. I'm not carnally minded because he says in chapter 8 in verse 4, uh, verse 6, uh, for to be carnally minded is death. No, he's spiritually minded, which is life and peace. He says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Paul's mind isn't enmity against God. He's not describing in chapter 7 a person who's en whose mind is at enmity with God. The carnal mind is pursuing the things of the flesh. The mind described in chapter 7 is pursuing the things of God, not the flesh, but is stumbled by the flesh periodically. I am carnal. I have a physical body. I have, the, I have human flesh. I have Adamic nature. I, I, have, I have those things that make me stumble. He's not saying I'm one of those carnal Christians who has a carnal mindset and carnal values and carnal compromises in my life. That's not the same thing. Saying I am carnal... We, we have come to describe, if we describe someone as carnal, we usually mean they're a, a, an unspiritual person. But all people, however spiritual, are carnal if they have a body. They have a physical flesh. And carnal just means I'm fleshly. I'm made of flesh. Can't get over that. What about in verse 14 where he says he's sold under sin? How could a Christian be called sold under sin? Well, Paul here frequently makes a distinction between the body and himself. And, and it certainly is his body that is sold under sin. Not him as a man, uh, but him as a body. And that's why he says in chapter 8, verse 23, he's looking forward to the redemption of his body. He wants to be you know, bought out of this slavery. His, this sin still is in his body. His body is sold by Adam into sin. But the time is coming when I'll be bought out of that sin. Now, I've been redeemed in other respects already, but I haven't, my body hasn't been redeemed. And so he says, we're looking for the redemption of our body. In the meantime, our body is sold under sin. It's in, with my flesh, I serve the law of sin, he said in verse 25, chapter 7. I mean, you can't say that's not true of a Christian. Your body still is got this sin trying to exert mastery over it, and you're not totally free from that until the resurrection. That's going to be the redemption of the body. And of course, those statements in chapter 6, shall we continue in sin? Uh, or he's answering the question, shall we continue in sin? He says, no, we, we, sin shall not have dominion over you. That is more or less an imperative. Like I said, in chapter 6, when he says uh, in verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not a prediction. It's an imperative. It essentially means you shall not allow it to have dominion over you. 
Remember, he's not talking in chapter 6 about how to live a sinless life and describing, in fact, a sinless life. He's describing the obligation to not live a sinful life. And uh, the obligation, as he shows us in chapter 7, is not always easy to meet, even if you want to. Even when you want to stop sinning, you find there's something else to deal with. It's called sin in your, in your members, a law of sin. Now, you're going to see in verse 2 of chapter 8, he's going to say, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and of death. So the problem that makes me sin that law of sin in my flesh, that I can be free from it. But what does it mean to be free from it? First of all, it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ that does it. So the, the solution is going to be found in the Holy Spirit. But in what sense does the Holy Spirit set me free from it? And this is something that we need to um, grasp here in Paul. Because someone might say, well... The law of the spirit of life makes me free from it when I, enti when I experience entire sanctification or when I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit and I receive the power from on high or something like that. Now, by the way, I'm not against sanctification and I, and I have been baptized in the Spirit and I believe in that. But I don't think Paul's talking about that because even though I've been baptized in the Spirit, that hasn't been the total solution to sin in my life. I've still sinned since then. So just getting filled with the Spirit or just getting something called sanctification, if that's really available, entire sanctification, then uh, that people I know who have supposedly received entire sanctification, they still have their sin issues. So what? how is it that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes me free from the law of sin? And here he's talking specifically about that principle in me that makes me sin. If I'm free from that, I'm not going to be sinning, right? True, I'm not. But how is this freedom from that law obtained? The, the uh, illustration I always use, because it's a good one, and it's not original with me. Someone wrote to me, I, I used this on the air, I think, last week, and someone wrote to me and said, oh, that was brilliant. You're, you're brilliant. No, I'm not brilliant. This, is, this has been often used. This is not mine. The only thing about me that's brilliant is to not forget it so I can repeat it. But I'm, I'm plagiarizing here. I don't know who I'm plagiarizing. But it's an old illustration that works perfectly well, and I, I like it. And that is that Paul, when Paul talks about the law of sin as members, he's talking about a principle like, like, a, like, uh, like a law of nature, like the law of gravity. And, and the law of gravity is really kind of a good analogy because gravity pulls you down. If you want to ascend to the heights, you're going to have the gra law of gravity preventing you from doing that. If you want to climb a mountain, gravity is going to make that very, very difficult. If it's a really, really high mountain, gravity will keep you from getting all the way there because you get worn out first. It's good. You use all your effort, but gravity is working against you all the time. If you want to pole vault and, and go over a, a 30 foot high bar, gravity is going to probably prevent you from doing that too. You can't just float through the air. There's, I mean, gravity is uh, bondage to the earth. Sin in my members might be said to be sort of like that, sort of like spiritual gravity or moral gravity. It pulls me down. It tends to. It tends to pull me down to lower behavior than I want to. I want to rise above that. I don't want to sin, but this law is dragging me down, so I can't seem to get over it. But he says the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. Does that mean the law of sin and death doesn't exist anymore once I have the spirit? Not necessarily. The analogy is that it's like when you go up in an airplane, you find that there are other laws besides the law of gravity, natural laws. The airplane is able to lift off the ground, not because gravity doesn't exist, but because there's laws of aerodynamics, which the machine is engineered to exploit. And as it moves forward and, and so forth, the, the wings are shaped in such a way that the wind under and the wind above are proportioned such as it, there's something called lift in it, and the laws of aerodynamics defeat the law of gravity. For 6,000 years, human beings were never able to defeat the law of gravity, except maybe with hot air balloons, but, and that too exploits the laws of, of, uh, of aerodynamics in a way, 
or maybe some other laws. But the point is that when the airplane was invented, finally man could defeat gravity, at least for a while, as long as he was using those laws of aerodynamics. Now, when the plane runs out of fuel, it's going to fall to the ground because it can't, it needs not only lift but thrust and so forth, and it's going to lose out on that. And a helicopter, when it runs out of gas, doesn't have any lift, and it just goes right down. So the law of laws of aerodynamics make me free from the law of gravity, but only as long as I'm exploiting them. They don't make me permanently free. They just make me provisionally free. I have the option, as long as I can use the laws of aerodynamics, I have the option of not succumbing to gravity. I could be eight miles high. Uh, and gravity would have it the other way, but the gravity doesn't win. Aerodynamics win. But you see, if I'm sitting in the airplane that eight miles off the ground or six miles off the ground, more likely, and I say, wow, look at the, everything's so small. To I'm, I'm above it all. Normally, I can't even get higher than those trees down there, not even as high. And now here, I'm, you know, miles high. I'm free from the law of gravity, obviously. Well, there's a sense which that's true. But as soon as I step out the door of that airplane feeling too free, I'll find that I, as soon as I'm not in the airplane, the laws of aerodynamics are not working for me. And what's there? Gravity. It's still there as much as it ever was. Gravity doesn't go away. It's just that aerodynamic laws can counteract it, can overcome it, while they are being employed. But you, as soon as they're not being employed, gravity wins again. Now, in the moral sense or the spiritual sense, this is true also. There is a law that can overcome the law of sin in my members. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ. As I employ that power, that law that God has made available through Christ, it makes me free. Just like when I'm in the airplane, I'm free from the law of gravity, so to speak. But not unconditionally, not uh, without provision. I have to, I'm provisionally free from it while I'm using it. So as I'm walking in the power of the Spirit, as I'm walking in the Spirit, I do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what Paul said in Galatians 5.16. The lust of the flesh rule me like gravity does. Unless I'm walking in the Spirit, then I'm exploiting some other laws higher than that, higher than the law of sin and death. The law of the life in Christ and the Spirit of life in Christ makes me free from the law of sin and death, and I don't do what the flesh wants to do when I am walking in the Spirit. So Galatians 5, 6 says, I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so here also in Romans 8, 4, you'll see, and we'll come back to this you know, in our next session, but in Romans 8, 4, he says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Walking according to the Spirit. Now, we talked about stumbling. Now we're talking about walking. Walking and stumbling are not the same thing. They're related but opposite to each other. When you're walking, you're taking steps and not falling down. You're moving forward. When you're stumbling, that's an interruption. You're not moving forward. You're not standing up. You're falling down. You're making no progress when you're stumbling. Stumbling is an interruption of walking. It's an unwelcomed one, but it sometimes happens because of weakness, inattention, carelessness, whatever. People sometimes stumble when they've been walking. So what's the difference between walking and stumbling? Walking means you took a successful step and you didn't fall down. You took another successful step and you didn't fall down. You took another. And as long as you do that, you're walking. The first time you take an unsuccessful step, you go down. You're not walking at that moment. You're stumbling. Now, it's understandable when babies stumble, when they're learning to walk, because they're not experienced at it. It's amazing they even try. A lot of times they're getting around real good on all fours, but something in them makes them want to stand up and walk. There's a human instinct that God put in us that makes us want to stand upright and walk. So the baby is not content just to shuffle around on its butt like they sometimes do or just crawl around on all fours, even if they're faster at it than they are at walking. They insist on walking. And so eventually they start trying to do it. And when they do, they take a step, maybe a step, and fall down. Maybe two, three steps before they fall down the first time, if they're a prodigy. But the thing here is that when the parents see those steps, they see the average step, they see the baby on its butt on the ground because it fell down. They say, wow, baby took his first steps. Yay, let's have a cake. Let's have a celebration. 
And the baby only took one step or two and went down. But that's good. That's enough. That's a start. Now, when the baby's five years old, the baby better be not falling down every time it takes two or three steps. Because you can take it to the doctor and see, you know, need a specialist. What's wrong with this child? It's five years old, still can't walk. But you see, you get better. You get better at it. You get more experience at it as you do it consistently. Now, if a baby took two or three steps and fell down and said, okay, I'm done, and didn't try anymore, it, it would never walk any better than that. It's because the baby gets up again and keeps trying and eventually gets good at it. And once you're our age, well, no, we're kind of past the age I'm talking about, where uh, <laughs> when you get to your prime, you don't fall down much at all. When you get my age, you kind of start falling down again once in a while. But that's because of the, the laws of thermodynamics and sin and all that stuff, but and mortality. But the truth is, that after you've reached a certain threshold, you don't fall down much at all, but you still might. A person can be an athlete who runs faster than anyone else, but they can still stumble at times and have been known to do so. I remember that seeing Chariots of Fire when Eric Little was uh, running in one of those races before the Olympics, and one of the guys bumped him and he knocked him off the course, and he goes down, he rolls over a couple times, and and the runners keep going, and he gets back on his feet, and he gets back up and runs and wins, wins the race, even though he's had a setback. That stumbling, that's an embarrassing thing to happen when you're running in front of a crowd. You don't want that to happen. But he doesn't just say, well, I guess I'm down. It's comfortable down here. I think I'll stay here. No, he gets back up and says, that's not okay. I'm going to keep running. I'm going to keep winning. And he did. And so walking is that way, walking in the spirit. We don't do it perfectly, but we should get better at it. A young Christian is very unfamiliar with walking in the spirit and may, do it, may fall down as often as they take a successful step for a while. But eventually, they're walking more consistently as a Christian in the power of the Spirit and not sinning at those times. But as soon as you stumble, you're sinning again because the gravity is still there. As soon as the aerodynamics are not working, you're down on the ground again. So the Christian life is the, the, the law of sin that I'm in bondage to. I can beat it, but I can't just flip a switch and beat it once and for all. Okay, I'm living a sinless life now. It's all cool. No, I, I have to say, okay... Every time I take a step, I have to walk in the Spirit. I have to not be careless. I need to watch where I'm stepping. I need to watch out for dangers. Uh, I need to watch out for slippery spots. Uh, you know, Because even as an adult, you may walk outside and go right down because there's ice on the sidewalk you didn't know about. Anything. That's real embarrassing when it happens. But hey, you're an experienced walker. You don't fall down much, but it happens still if you're not careful. So the Christian walk is one that depends moment by moment step by step, on the power of the Holy Spirit. As soon as you get careless about that, you're likely to fall down again, especially if you've been real successful. If you're a spiritual person who's been walking in the Spirit for years, you might begin to forget that you need the Holy Spirit and just start thinking, I'm good at this, you know, I, I, can, I can handle this. And when you start being self-reliant instead of on the Spirit of God, that's when sometimes tra tragic falls take place. Scandals and things happen to preachers sometimes who've just gotten a little too overconfident that they uh, they don't have to be that careful anymore because they're now too spiritual, too big to fall, too big to fail. But they uh, they do anyway fail in some cases. Only the spirit day by day can prevent that. So my thought is that Paul is able to speak in the present tense. This is him when he's not walking in the spirit. Now, he probably did walk in the spirit most of the time. But he wasn't perfect. Anyone can fall. James said we stumble. And when we do, we're not being perfect. And Paul probably stumbled too. But when he wasn't walking in the Spirit, it was like this. When he stumbled, it was like this. I wanted to do the right thing, but somehow there was something, this other law in me, this law of gravity that pulls me down. Uh, but I have found there's another law that makes me free from that. And as I walk in the Spirit, the the Spirit, law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes me free from the law of sin and death. So in chapter 8, the answer, at least part of it, is walk in the spirit. I say part of it because when Paul asks, who will deliver me from this body of death, there's really three parts to the answer. The first one is covered very quickly in Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation. But he's already discussed that thoroughly in the previous chapters. He spends no more time on it. He's no longer going to talk about justification, which is the opposite of condemnation. That's the first part of the solution. 
we've kind of been over that ground. Now we want to talk about, as we say, sanctification or walking, uh, you know, overcoming the power of sin. That's walking in the spirit. That's the solution there. But near the end of the chapter, we're going to get to uh, a third part, and that is even the redemption of our bodies, which is glorification when we're raised from the dead. So Paul's going to, Paul sees three parts to the answer. What is the deliverance from this sinfulness? I have? Well, first of all, God doesn't condemn you for it because you're a Christian. Justification is part of the solution. Another part is he gives you his spirit to walk in the spirit. That's the sanctification process. And then, of course, you're going to have glorification at the end of this life when he's going to take this troublesome body away altogether and give you a new one that doesn't have all these weaknesses and stuff. So we're going to see that as we go through chapter 8. But this is how I understand chapter 7 and what Paul's saying there.